Friends, good evening and welcome to Dazed After Dark, where we, we're going to do this on Sunday. Usually we meet at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to do a Q&A at the end of the week. We answer any questions on videos that went out this week, any questions that you have about Scientology, anything at all, actually, everything's on the table, but we had to reschedule due to some work going on behind the scenes for future content. So thanks for joining us. Those of you that can make it here on a Monday evening, you little whippersnappers, you late night owls, because chow, most, most of the um, audience is from 50% is from the USA and they're usually on the East coast, it seems. So it would be about 11 o'clock. Where are you guys from? How are you doing? And why are you not asking who this strange person is that I have on the screen? Cricket, you want to introduce yourself and tell us um, what you're doing here? How did you wind up here? Explain yourself. You can't hear me? <laughs> okay, I don't think she can hear me, guys, but at least we have her in the background. She's um, been kind enough to offer to star questions and throw anything out so that I can just focus on the actual conversation. And so we're very, very lucky to have her. Sorry, we can't uh, hear you, Cricket, but we'll boot you off and we will get started. So um, if you see... We're still testing this out. So if you see my name in the chat, that will be um, Cricket. She's also known as Chow Yun Smut, and she's a regular on the channel. And uh, it, we're still testing this out. So she might be posting as me. Philosophy always coming in with the questions hot off the bat. I really appreciate that, man, because you make my job a lot easier. So let's take up this. Um, you can see what's on your mind, philosophy. Sex, sex, sex. Now, but seriously, that is isn't beat, beat into us in Scientology. And the question that philosophy asked was, with the whole pain, and I see your other ones too, my friend. I just wanted to take this up because it's a good comment to jump off of. With the whole pain and sex policy of Hubbard, along with no wanking and general repression, that is, in stimulating negative images that need to be cleared, how are these things considered negative or associated with pain? These things are not necessarily negative if they are pleasurable. So how does Elrond explain that pleasure is pain? Good question. Is this part of the system that allows for and covers up abuse? Yes. Good observation. I've heard surge. I, I think that that would be, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Not Serge Del Mar. Damn it. I know who you're talking about with surge. Very outspoken. Um, he was an auditor having to deal with, uh, sexually repressed men and women in the cult as a kid, as a top level auditor, having to listen to people's bullshit. So I've heard Serge mention about Hubbard being a sadomasochist uh, in how he operated. True. His ideas and policies, given his connections to Crowley's sex magic. Yes. And having policies called pain and sex, I'd be inclined to agree. Only a true sadist would twist it to pain and repression, domination and submission, and a lot of blame and shame. But I'm interested in how he justifies this pleasure in pain concept. And is there any uh, sex that's considered okay? Or is it all creating end games? You mean engrams, of course? That's a really good question. So basically, you're right on. I mean, Hubbard's just acting out his own traumas um, regarding sex. He would do abortion rituals um, with his wife, which his son Nibs witnessed. He was into the black magic and the sex magic of Crowley. That was a main inspiration from 15 years old on when he first picked up the book of the law by Crowley. So that's where a lot of it comes from his own problems. He had massive problems in masturbation. We, I don't know if you saw that video philosophy, but, um, I think it's called L Ron Hubbard's affirmations where it's his most intimate secrets about how he feels about himself. And what he would do is put himself, he would do drugs and then put himself under hypnosis. And on a tape recorder, he'd read out these, or he'd play out these affirmations to him. And many of them were like, you are a sexual prowess. You do, you know, masturbation does not cause your balls to hang low and all this crazy ass shit showing just how fucked up he was in Scientology and Dianetics was um, obviously his cure. And he, since he felt that he cured himself or he believed that he passed his sickness on to us. So basically it's just his own sickness and hangups with sex. But I did find some, some policies to go over um, on that just real briefly. And one of the main things about that is, too, that um, he equates um, pain uh, with sex because of the whole psychiatry narrative that runs through Scientology. And the mo that is the most evil people on the planet are psychiatrists. They've been on the whole track, meaning all past lives, all throughout history. 
They're the number one people that have done mankind in. And he says that the Sykes installed pain or installed sex as a implant, as not a real thing, not a natural human desire, so to speak. Although that doesn't make a lot of sense because how would you recreate, but don't try to make sense of Hubbard's word words. And I'm paraphrasing. I mean, this pain and sex bulletin is in one of, I flash it up, but I couldn't find it before this stream. It's in one of the episodes on the series, if you want to see the full reference, but it breaks down to the psychiatrist installed sex, which is evil. It causes pain. And the two main contributions that the psychs made were pain and sex, and that he called them electronic waves that are not um, inherent to a being. They've been added by the Sykes. Don't ask me to explain that. All I know is that I feel like, well, he was, uh, they threatened to throw him in a loony bin. One of his ex wives, um, came very close to getting him committed. And the one fear that he had, because I think he knew he was crazy is that he never wanted to be thrown into a loony bin. So that's why I think he when the psychiatrist who he was trying to prove that he was sane to didn't accept Dianetics and Scientology, which he thought, you know, they'd be blown away by. And they called it, in fact, psychological folklore. Um, he was really hurt by that, tried to prove his sanity more by targeting psychiatry as the number one enemy and made up a whole fantasy, whole track, fake um, reality in his head about the psychiatrist and how they created pain and sex. I mean, that's basically the explanation. But here's a little bit more on it from the uh, from the wiki page. The beliefs and practices of the cult include material related to sex, a ton of material related to sex, and the rearing of children, which collectively form the second dynamic, and that's known as the urge toward survival in Scientology. These beliefs are practice. These beliefs and practices are based on the written works of the cult. So let's see. Regards the pain and sex part, here's what um, here's what he says. So on August 26, 1982, Hubbard authored a Hubbard Communication Office Bulletin entitled Pain and Sex, in which he accuses psychiatrists, abbreviated psychs, of orchestrating a global conspiracy to undermine society and spread chaos. Combined pain and sex make up the insane Jack the Rippers, who killed only prostitutes, and the whole strange body of sex murder freaks, including Hinckley, and the devotees of late night horror movies. In other words, if you're into watching late night horror movies, you could be a victim of the Sykes and the whole track via the implanting of pain and sex. Under the false data of the Sykes, who have been on the track for a long time and are the sole cause of decline in the universe, both pain and sex are gaining ground in this society. Oh no. And coupled with robbery, which is a hooded companion of both, may very soon make the land a true jungle of crime. Wow, holy shit, I haven't read that in years, but that sounds bonkers. I don't um, take issue with the fact that things are ramping up in the world, but you can see his whole cosmology and narrative as to why that would be. Not quite accurate. In the same bulletin, Hubbard claims that pain and sex are both invented tools of degradation by destructive creatures, referencing the psychiatrist, with the intention to shrink, to shrink people and cut their alert, alertness, knowingness, power, and reach. Again, that's what it's all about, you know. Um, the psychs installed it, and um, we got to get rid of it. And that's just one of the ways that sex is repressed. It said that you can't masturbate because you're pulling in pictures on your reactive mind. I wasn't able to find the reference to that philosophy. But um, there's all sorts of policies like that where somehow um, if you jack off, you are causing pictures to come in in your reactive mind that are harmful and that will prevent your progress going up the stupid bridge to total freedom. Thanks for that question. All right. Chow's got them all lined up. Jane, how are you doing, my friend? The video is about Church of Scientology. Oh, also, so I can take this annoying thing out of the bottom here, and Chow's running things in the back. If you have any questions, please, you know, put up the question marks. And then if anybody says Xenu on something that we pull up, if you guys want to kind of hang out and um, get fucked up a little bit, I've got my weed pipe. We're not encouraging uh, drugs or drink, but it's a end of the week type thing, although it's a Monday. So if you want to throw the word Xenu out and we can um, chill out a little. So let me pull that off of there. So Jane says the video is about Church of Scientology training. It seems people are always very close to each other. Why do you think there is no respect for personal space? 
Well, Jane, that's all part of purposely breaking down your boundaries. And that begins at the, generally speaking, one of the very first courses that you ever do called the communication course. And hopefully this video will help to answer your question. But um, it's just as simple as, I remember doing these drills as a kid where we're told to stare at each other and we're almost locking knees. And the way that they explain it in the bulletin that you read is a, a somewhat rational explanation about confronting as to why it's okay to be that close. Uh, actually, real no, no real explanation is given for why you need to be kind of touching knees, but that's the instructions. And just getting used to having your boundaries invaded in a seemingly innocuous way like that, where how is that gonna take hold in real life? How is that gonna translate to really letting your boundaries down? I gotta tell you, just doing little theater games, which is what a lot of Scientology is, like doing drills and stuff, it does become a part of your subconscious. So even though we were, you know, as a kid, I was just sitting close to someone, reading out of Alice in Wonderland, doing things that are strange that would seem like you could just throw it off, you know, like in an acting class and carry on with your life. These simple techniques of getting used to someone touching your knees. My dad would do, you know, touch assists on me as a kid. So he would be used to invading my, my space by literally touching me as part of a Scientology process. These things done over and over really do um, lessen your boundaries in a very subtle way, all under the guise of, like I said, theater games or auditing or helping you out. So here's a short video on the very first drill on that communication course, and it explains a little bit about some of the things that are going on, as well as um, breaking down the boundaries. This is from a video called Theta Trap. Let me throw you guys over here in the chat too, because it's way too boring without having you guys here. So check this out. Today, Jesse and I are going to demonstrate uh, what Scientology calls the training routines, or TRs. Scientologists are taught that the TRs are designed to help them communicate better with other people. Critics of Scientology feel that the TRs create a hypnotic state in a person, or a trance-like state in a person that makes them more easy to manipulate or to control. Today, Jesse and I are going to demonstrate these TRs and you can make your own decision about what they do. The first one we're gonna do is called OTTR0, which stands for Operating Thetan Zero. And the training stress of this exercise is two people sit facing each other with their eyes closed without twitching or moving or using a system or a body part to be there comfortably. And this is what OTTR zero looks like. Ready? Okay. So OTTR zero is your first encounter with sensory deprivation, hypnosis, and mind control. The hypnotic techniques used in this drill are sensory deprivation and stress, which produces an altered state of consciousness. In the Philadelphia doctorate course lectures, Hubbard says that closing your eyes puts you into a light hypnotic trance. So here, Elrond lies about training you to confront. In fact, he's putting you into a trance, a trance built upon the gradient and which becomes the basis for all auditing. The sensory deprivation is audio as well as visual. The TRs are done in a large chorus room where other students are also doing their TRs. So one hears all the Scientology babble, which causes confusion and lowers the mind's defenses. Of course, the visual is completely cut off in OTTR0, and students are sat facing one another with their knees almost touching. By violating someone's personal space, as well as being violated yourself, you're going to create more stress and apprehension, which of course is the goal of these drills. In an actual training routine, this would go on for... So you can see how close they're sitting, right? Um, hopefully that answered somewhat of your question. There's many drills that break down boundaries, but it starts right here at the beginning and it's often the communication course. A lighter, ver there's a professional version and a light one for like 50 or 100 bucks that you can do right off the bat. And this is how the breaking down of the boundaries, the installing of the hypnotic stare, and everything that's to come to make you stay in Scientology forever, this is where it all starts. And uh, again, no explanation is given. You just need to do the fucking drill, basically. Let's play a little bit more, but I'll link this video in the description box if you'd like to see the full communication course and what's really happening versus what they say is happening. Many hours, sometimes days. People talk about um, sitting here um, with their eyes closed and starting to feel very lightheaded 
um, starting to hallucinate, and they have to sit there with their eyes closed, as we just demonstrated, until they no longer feel these kinds of things, um, until they can just sit here comfortably and not hallucinate or, or feel lightheaded or anything like that. I mentioned okay, in, that's good enough on that. Um, thanks for the question, my friend. I hope that answered it. And if it didn't, please feel free to um, to expand on it. And we can take it up. Let me move this over a little bit. Um, okay. So much easier, by the way, Cricket. We have Cricket in the background. If you're just joining us, we finally have someone to star the questions. Cricket, please feel free to throw up comments if people are saying hi or whatever, too. She's in control of everything, and I can just focus on... Um, so much more on this stream. So I really appreciate you helping out cricket just because you can't see her doesn't mean she's not hard at work in the backstage. I see you <laughs> anyways. Um, Jojo. Oh my, what is Doug's star sign? I wonder, um, I was born in July. So that's July, 1973. Um, that would make me cancer, right? Cancer. Get it. <laughs> so funny, Doug. Um, question. Hey, Jojo, what type of narcissist do you think he was, Doug? That's a great question. And I would have to throw it, throw it at HG Tutor to get this a mid ranger or a greater man. He was so schizophrenic. We're talking about L Ron Hubbard, I assume, right, Jojo. And then David Miscavige, he would be a lesser narcissist. Um, I'm sure he's more the bully type Hubbard. I would say would be a mid ranger or could possibly oops oh or could possibly be a greater but I would have to go through um, HG Tutor since I think he would be the one to, he's the expert when it comes to you know breaking him down and one of these days you know we're doing an interview in a few days I think it's like interview fifteen or sixteen on the seventeenth so what is it now so in four days we're gonna do an interview if you guys have any questions that you want me to ask him. Because we've covered a lot, and I was going to actually go through, because there's so many backlog questions to ask that dude. If you have any questions, let me know. And one of them that I'm going to ask him, but I don't think he's going to be able to answer, is who, yeah, was L. Ron Hubbard a greater? Was he a self-aware narcissist? Was he a mid-ranger? And what school in Cathra, right? That'd be interesting. The only problem is he's not going to be able to bust that out um, like in two seconds. He would do a whole research on it. And that um, I've never paid him before. He's never asked a dime. Uh, you know, I just get to interview him for free. But if I wanted him to do the work, which would take him X amount of hours because he'd have to research Hubbard to get the answer. Um, I'm not going to do that. So but I will I will ask him that question because I've always wondered about that myself. Like I said, any questions that you have for HG Tutor, please throw them in the comments afterwards so I can just grab them and I'll fucking fire them to him in the next interview. That's what I want to do anyways. So I don't know the answer, Jojo. What do you think he is? You know, you studied HG's work and you probably know who Hubbard is, right? What do you think he is if you had to take a guess? Do you think he was aware of his uh, Machiavellianism? Probably. Okay, Rosebud, and I got your um, I got your comment, my friend. So that's Amy. Okay, what are you doing, Chow? That's not me, guys. I have my hands off. Cricket, we got to keep it on the same question, though, man. Uh, what could you contribute to? Um, oh, thanks, Jojo. But where was that question um, from? Like I said, we're just getting the hang of this shit. So we got me and me and uh, Cricket working double time. But I would like to get back to that question. Are you able to pull it up, Cricket, that Rosebud, Amy, put out there? Maybe it was just a comment. Rosebud, I'm sorry I missed it, but I'm going to go ahead and take this one up. Please type it in again. And... Um, all right, Chow, you got to keep the question up, man, I, uh, until, I, until I answer it, um, if you don't mind. So let me go to the pinned comments, and I'll pull one up here. Okay, there it is. I did, get your, um, I did get your comment, my friend, so I will address you properly, finally. Um, Rosebud and is um, your nickname as well as Amy. So Amy asks, Doug, when did you start acting, and what age did you join Scientology? I got into, I was inspired by acting around 12 years old when I saw um, Silver Spoons with a guy named Ricky Schroeder, who I thought I kind of looked like at the time. I felt instantly I want to do that, and I wonder if I can do that. And then around 14 years old, a couple years later, 
I went to a Thousand Oaks movie theater here in California, Thousand Oaks, California. I mean, I remember this like it was yesterday. I'm sure you guys, oh, we got Alonzo in the house. It'll be really interesting to see what you have to, what you have to say. Um, make sure you star Alonzo's question there, Cricket. The ever controversial OSA agent slash narcissist himself. Alonzo, maybe you can shed some insight on this. Anyways, be, before I digress, um, so 14 years old, um, I remember sitting in the theater. I don't know if you guys have seen Stand By Me. Fuck it, man. I mean, we can like play shit and relax here, right? I would like to show you guys the trailer because I'll never forget this actor. He came up in an interview that I did today, which will be on another channel in a couple of days. And I just wanted to give some, um, as they say in Scientology, some mass on who the fuck I'm talking about in this incredible movie. If you guys haven't seen it, and then I'll tell you about what happened after that and how I got into Scientology. But we don't have to worry about copyright because it's this channel is not monetized. So why not play some cool shit while we're here? This is the trailer for Stand By Me. The official trailer, but it's hard to kind of find the, or maybe it is. By the way, there's more to say about Rob Reiner, you know, and on him on, on set with the kids and stuff, as you guys might know, River, let me point out River Phoenix and I'll tell you a little bit about his history if you, if you don't already know. Okay, so that's River right there. His brother is Joaquin Phoenix, and they were raised in the Children of God cult. River um, suffered sexual abuse uh, at the hands of the cult beginning at, at age four up to age 10. I mean, we were talking about, you know, Hubbard fucking up people's sexuality. Cults in general try to control sex. That's one of the main aspects where if you can get that under control, like we talked about before, you can lead someone around like they're on a dog leash. And River had it the worst, man, because he was passed around to members of the cult at fucking age four to have sex. And he lost his virginity very young. And it was a whole ceremony in a tent that his parents and the whole cult community put on. I mean, can you imagine having sex where like literally everybody and their mother knows about it, let alone the fact that it's happening when you're like 10 years old, um, like his first official girlfriend or whatever. That cult was so fucked up, man. I, I think that that had a big reason why he might have had problems with going on and off in drugs. Often when you go through trauma-based mind control and one of these cults like River did, you wake up in your 20s or 30s. I give you Britney Spears and a host of other um, celebrities that have been traumatized. And then when they get older, their brain kind of either cracks or attempts to make sense of the trauma. And I think that's what was happening to River when he got up to some stuff. And there's a whole nother deep dive, which we definitely will do one day on River because it's fascinating. But back to the um, trailer so I can answer the fucking question. I just love this guy, man, even though I never met him. And sorry for the ramble, but I miss this fucking dude some, for some reason. Jesus! <laughs> this is really a good time. Something on your neck. Legion! Oh my god! I want to see a dead kid. Maybe it shouldn't be a party. I'm never going to get out of this town now, my glory. You think Mighty Mouse could beat up Superman? What are you, cracked? I'll kill you, I swear to God. We know what happened with Corey Feldman and shit too, man. It's kind of tragic what happened with um, his best mate, you know, who also suffered sexual abuse uh, from Charlie Sheen when he was raped by him. I mean, just Hollywood is full of this fucking crap. Okay, so that's that. Chow, I think we lost the question, man. Please keep it up um, until I can answer it. But I think I remember it. So um, Rosebud asked, basically, how the fuck did I get into acting? How old was I? And then how did I get into Scientology? It's also kind of interesting that they were simultaneous. So when I you know, first 
wanted to be an actor. It was about a year or so. so. Let's say my dad got into Scientology when I was around nine. That's basically when I remember him coming home with that glazed, hypnotized look, and he was rambling about needing to start Scientology and shit. He was about nine years old. And then a year or two after that, I saw Ricky Schroeder on um, Silver Spoons. I said, Pops, I want to do that. What do you guys think? I was dead serious. I really wanted to move to LA or audition right away. Uh, they told me you have to wait until you get out of high school. And then it became, now you have to go to college, whatever. I finally had to bail my parents and like do what I wanted to do. That's a story we've talked about before. Then come Stand By Me at 14 years old. All the kid actors were awesome, but there was something about River. And I do think there is something about, I was in a cult. He was in a cult. Obviously, I don't know this, and he probably didn't know it at the time, but perhaps there was a subconscious relating or connection to really having such a drive at a young age, knowing what I wanted to do early on, like I was dead serious about it, and it felt like my calling. And where does that come from? You know, who knows? So shortly after that, um, I break down around 20 years old, which you talked about at a vulnerable point. I had tons of Scientology indoctrination because my parents would say, do you want to be punished for X amount of weeks, or do you want to take a course at Scientology? After telling them to go fuck themselves for many times, I finally took the path of least resistance and said, give me the goddamn course. I can get through it and it'll be faster and I won't have to be grounded for weeks. So that um, that coincided with um, really begging my parents to uh, do acting. It's really weird, man. Like, I can't take back the Scientology experience. I mean, it was fucking horrible in terms of like, it sucks being under a spell than waking up in your 30s and having to go through like this whole transition. But uh, I do accept my journey, whatever it's been, the good and the bad, because it's all piece. Of, it's all it makes it's who I am. And I, I, um, I accept it. And also it if there was no Scientology, there would be no acting. I never would have moved out to Hollywood if I didn't have the confidence to have a place to land, i.e. a Scientology base. And I had instant friends and it was in an auditing session on grade four when I had this revelation to rekindle my purpose, tell my parents to go fuck themselves about college and everything. I bailed the girlfriend and I finally had the drive to go out to LA and take a crack at it. And it simply it would have passed my consciousness. It would have never come into my mind in a weird way without Scientology being in our life. So is it meant to be? Is it a bunch of happy accidents? I don't fucking know. But um, also drawing from the trauma that, um, that I experienced, you know, the deep emotions, that also I feel like was... Um, I think that deep down I was trying to heal my ass um, from an early age. You know, as a kid, you don't recognize that you have a narcissistic dynamic in your family. You just try to defend yourself, walk on eggshells. I learned how to read my parents' emotions. I needed to anticipate my mom and my dad, what they were going to, what I was going to do that was going to set them off. You add Scientology and the cult into it, trauma. All of that makes up for someone I think that might become an artist because I think a lot of artists are um, trying to heal something. If you don't have the emotions, if you don't have the juice, if you don't have the trauma, if you don't have any life experience to speak from, I don't know what the fuck you're going to create in terms of any good art. And that's what was registering when I saw River Phoenix all those years ago. I hope that answers your question. So tell you what, Chow, I got plenty of starred questions so I can pull them up. Um, because I feel like we're battling each other accidentally. So let me pull up Cindy. Um, yeah, I told, we have Cricket in the, in the background helping us out, and I told her to throw up whatever comment she wants. So my bad, Cricket, but why don't you just, we'll have to work this out off screen, but for right now, you got plenty of starred questions. So I got them in the can here. Let's just keep the comments up for the time being. Um, and I guess we'll have to skip, you know, you throwing up hello and all the other shit. We'll figure it out later. But for now, thanks for starring this shit. I got plenty to go with. Fuck yeah, finally. Faye, awesome. <laughs> Every time someone says Xenu, we get fucked up. So don't mind if I do. This is where we take a hit of our favorite poison. Actually, we kind of change it to Xenu Marlene because we have, um, we've had Marilyn on. Marilyn Honeg, who shared her story recently. And since she's had the bravery to speak about her cult leader named Marlene, um, friend of uh, all of ours made this little thing, uh, a friend named Kelly Copter, who you guys might know, if I could just pull my ass out of here. 
made this thing called Xenu Marlene, where, God damn it, I'm still trying to get used to it. Okay, so anytime someone says Xenu, we take a hit of our favorite poison, we take a break. Like I said, this is the end of the week where we let our hair down and we chill out. So if anybody has a problem with this, go fuck yourself. Seriously, man, in the world we live in today, like, it's just amazing sometimes reading the comments, like, no matter what you say, almost any word you use, or no matter how precise you try to be in communicating, someone will be offended. It wasn't like that when I was growing up. It's like, it's like talk about walking on eggshells in today's world. It's like, I remember you could bust your mate's balls, you could say any words, and no one was really offended. And nowadays, if I use the word gal, that's been pointed out to me that that's super offensive. I've gotten a lot of shit for, how dare you smoke weed on screen? Fuck off, man. It's like, they're so, I just got out of a cult, so it really fucking rubs me the wrong way when everybody's so goddamn offended all the time. Sorry for the rant. We smoke some weed to chill out. It's been a rough past couple days, my friends. Um, so there's the Xenu. Thank you very much for that, by the way. You guys are on your toes. So let me remove this ridiculous background. Only used for special times. Throw that back in. Okay, that's a pretty cool setup. Cindy, how are you? After all you've said, now the hell did you get out? Did you get here? I'm a never in, and this is so scary. Okay, after all you've said, how the hell did you get here? Meaning like, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Cindy, but I can take a, a riff on what I think you're asking. How did I like survive it and get here and speak out about it? If that's what you're asking, a very long, meticulous um, process over... 15 years. I got out in January, 2008. Stand by. I spent a good 10 years full time deprogramming, i.e. taking the trap apart. I really got obsessed with learning about psychology, hypnosis, mind control. I, because I found it fascinating. And because when I left Scientology, I found myself homeless. My family was against me. My whole integrated life uh, was destroyed. I couldn't focus on auditions for the five minutes that it took to go into the room, shut the trauma off, and try to deliver an audition. It completely took over my life when I literally snapped out of the hypnotic spell in one moment, in one day. And as long as that trauma, this is the weird part, Scientologists, you might not even recognize them, or any cult member, or anybody that's got some devastating fake belief system running their life, you can function normally and no one's going to call you out for it. Nobody cared that I was a Scientologist. Very few people knew it. They didn't think I was crazy. They didn't know the judgment that was going off on my head all the time about them. There was a lot of secrets that you can keep inside your brain, right? And nobody's going to suss it. But as soon as I got out of this fucking thing, what I'm trying to say is there's like a safety and your brain, your compartments of your mind, for lack of a better description, can stay together as long as you stay in Scientology and you stay within the program. But when you wake up, if my experience and others are anything to go by, especially if it's extreme, you suddenly meet all this trauma, all the unhandled problems that I went into Scientology for, right? I had original problems and then I thought Scientology was handling all that and then some. And then when I get out, I find myself regress back to childhood where not only do I have all the emotional and mental problems that I had before Scientology, I have this huge new problem where I don't know what the fuck just happened to me. So I have to take apart Scientology, what happened with me. I have all this emotional information that suddenly was available overnight that had been repressed for 35 fucking years. So I'm just trying to paint a picture because there's no way to describe it. I'm trying to, and other people that have been through this will know what, how, what I'm talking about. <laughs> It was just an enormous, if my mind was a computer, it was completely overloaded for a decade. So I got here by piece by piece by piece, believing, because I couldn't see it, but believing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I wanted to kill myself multiple times, but I was able to resist because I had to tell myself there's a rhyme and a reason and there's a purpose why this is happening. This has to be for some reason. And even if that was bullshit or is bullshit, I had to make up something in my mind because it really fucking sucked. You know, I mean, I had a family that um, as long as I was in Scientology, I could talk to them, I could access them. You know, my, me and my mom are finally speaking after all these years, but you know, can you imagine what it's like where you're, you're used to life one day, I worked 10 years to finally, you know, get enough 
credits on my resume. I signed with the big agency. I'm finally going to have the career I worked my ass off for. And I was like living my dreams. I had this amazing family. We all talked about Scientology every fucking night. We were super close. And I felt like I was really going spiritually free. I know it's, you know, all the videos we've been showing you guys lately and we've been laughing at this shit. And it is funny, man. I'm not like triggered by it anymore. It's okay to look at now, but I really did believe in that as silly as it looks. So when your spirituality, when, you know, which was a big part of my life is removed overnight, when my, you know, loving family turned on me and when I found myself, you know, um, unable to express myself short of having an acting class to go to. And like I said, the focus on work and everything, like I needed to figure out what happened to me. I couldn't really do anything else. So, um, a long ramble saying it, it fucking sucked. And that's why I'm super careful and why I take this seriously about making sure I never join another cult. So many people in this ex-Scientology community, my friends, they have belief systems that are just like Scientology or they never throw off the Scientology programming. There's a lot of Scientologist apologists in this um, community and rag on me for being anti-Scientology or anti-this. Those are just words. I'm not anti anything. I just recognize that I had a schizophrenic, schizophrenic mind transferred over to mine, and I wanted to get it the fuck out completely. And that takes a lot of work. And um, there was nothing good left in Scientology. It was all stolen. And like I said, the policies and the it, it, everything comes from a demented madman. So what's there to hold on to? And the process of letting that go and literally reforming a new belief system day by day, inch by inch. Having my friends and people around me mirror me what the hell friendship looks like. I had to learn what love looks like. I had to learn emotions. You know, we were talking about narcissists earlier. It makes you into a narcissist. It makes you into a, not a real one because you, you know, you have to be formed that way, but it makes you, it made me and other Scientologists so narcissistic that to have that flipped on its head, have your heart open up. You have to actually deal with real emotions. You can't run away to the cult. I can't suck on my mom's tit, you know, for fucking safety. I had nobody to run back to. And um, that was so terrifying and went on forever and sucked so bad. I'm very adamant on making sure that it doesn't happen again. And I just see so many people in this fucking community, man, that absolutely have cultic beliefs. Just because they left Scientology doesn't mean that anything's necessarily changed. You have to do a lot of inner work, man, is my opinion. Anyways, um, sorry for that long ramble. I think the Xenu is having an effect. I'll try to keep it shorter. Philosophy, how are you? Doug, your L. Ron voice is really funny. What other accents can you do? I can do a lot, Philosophy, but don't make me do them on the spot, man. I'll, I'll, I'll take your notes and I'll bust them out in future streams. We won't just go with the L. Ron voice. Or what accents do you wish you could do? Hmm, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I'm sure there's ones that I'd like to do that I can't do. I don't know. It's, I don't know the answer to that. There, I, I never thought of that. You know who's really good at doing accents, man? Gary Oldman. Do you know who that guy is? That actor? That guy can play everything from a four foot, like literal midget. I don't know how the hell they did that on screen. Can do any accent. Do you remember him playing Drexel in, uh, what was that movie? God damn it. I knew I was going to go blank. He plays like a black guy, a, a midget. Uh, he can do any accent. He's played a Russian. I mean, that guy's fucking amazing. So I don't know what accent I wish I could do, but I wish I had the uh, accent ability of someone like Gary Oldman, which I don't think I do. Love it. How are you? Actually, guys, I knew something was missing. Let me get you over here. It sucks not having you in the comments. I feel like I'm sitting here all alone. Okay, much better. Love it. Hey, Doug, I watched these videos more than 15 years ago, but didn't know where to find them. Are they on YouTube? Didn't the cult get them taken down? Are you talking about the TR videos that we just shown? Love it. If you don't mind and cricket, can you keep an eye out for love? It's comment. Love it. Just let me know what videos you're talking about and we'll throw it right. We'll throw it back up here. If you're talking about the TR videos and such, I mean, so many videos, not just from Scientology, but in general have been memory hold since, uh, around two, well building, I would say, Cause I, you know, this channel, I told you guys, man, I, I don't hide the fact that I'm a conspiracy theorist. Again, I just call it seeing through big lies. And let's just say a lot of, um, censorship has kicked in over the years. Thousands and thousands of YouTube channels have been memory hold in favor of pushing bullshit, uh, propaganda instead. 
So I remember around 2016, 2017, because I was always on the alternative uh, information and sites and shit, not QAnon, not Trump or Jesus saves. I just, I'm talking about trying to find out, well, one, trying to find out Scientology, which, which itself is a global conspiracy. And it has a spy versus spy game. It's loaded with espionage. It's loaded with murders, you know, made to look like suicides. Like it's a true crime novel, like come to life that I actually lived. So I'm not losing my mind by trying to understand what happened to me in Scientology. I myself was getting blown away. Learning that Hubbard was into the occult, that fucking ripped my mind apart. You don't understand like how different that is than what you're told he is. That would have never crossed my mind. I didn't know what the word occult fucking meant, let alone that Hubbard's into black magic shit. The whole thing was fucking mind blowing. So what I'm trying to say is I've been in the alternative media forever and I've watched around 2016, more and more channels go down 2017 and bam, right when the pandemic hit, so many channels went out and we just got bombarded with the official narrative. So um, how does that appertain to the question? Okay, so the Scientology videos, if it's the TR videos, I think they're still up and I'll link it if you let me know what you need, I love it. But a ton of shit, um, that I've been looking for to make the series. I got a ton of shit in the series and in the videos and even that we use in these live streams, which are on my hard drive. And thank God, I mean, I got a ton of shit. I got documentaries, everything. I got a bunch of shit that's saved and a lot of shit that I've already put up and used. Quick plug on the BitChute channel, by the way. It's totally free, man. Um, but please go to the BitChute channel because I got a lot of documentaries that you can't find, like on the Process Church, I think. Well, someone actually downloaded my version and they threw it back up on YouTube, but I got a ton of shit over there that you can't find really well-made documentaries. And then also, um, I've got everything. So let me know what you need. And, but the point being is it's, it's a shame, but you could find everything Scientology related, all the nitty gritty shit. And by the way, love it. I have been finding some obscure Scientology channels lately. I just watched, a, um, one the other night with Smurf. You remember Smurf? I don't remember the dude's actual name, but he was talking about how he was a, an uh, OSA member for 10 years, an ex-Scientologist, and how he was set up to murder um, Eugene Engram, no pun intended, and a few other people. I don't know if his story is true or not, but I just found this obscure channel the other night. I'd never seen that interview before. So I think you can find some of this shit out there, but tons of it have been memory hold. That's it for the ramble, but that's a great question. If I even knew what the hell it was, let me know what videos you're looking for. Escaping. How are you doing? My friend? Um, holy crap. I've never seen that broken down before. Wow. Which one, um, Gabrielle are you talking about? Cause I'm so far behind on the comments and questions, but if you don't mind, if you're still here, you don't mind popping it back in. Let me know what you're talking about. And it's really good to see you, man. If you want, if you want to do an interview, Gabrielle, I'd love to, um, people would love to hear your story over here. So let me know if you, if you'd be down for that. She has an incredible story and was, um, uh, I'll let her tell the story if she wants to come on. Okay. Love it. Just bought, oh, thanks man. Just bought Doug a coffee. Very cool. Hey guys, you don't have to at all. I'm never going to monetize this channel. It's not demonetized, but I've already gone into the reasons why I wouldn't even bother. I don't want to run ads every video. I have to worry about what I can and can't use. I need the creative expression because we're already being censored on such a level. Anyways, I don't want to monetize it. Okay. But I would like to make the about 100 and shit. I got to turn my light down. I don't know why that happened. Remember Aaron Smith Levin's lights go out? This is the first time the light has just jacked up. Stand by, but I'll come right back to that. Thank you so much, Levitt. That's cool, man. Okay, that should be fine. The point being, we had this coffee page. I know it's a pain in the ass for people to hit the link and whatever. I'm not trying to make money on this channel. I just wanted to try to break the break even on the cost. So it's about 150 bucks with the editing software. I use Restream, which is another 51 bucks or something. So I really appreciate the coffee contributions. I don't know why the hell anybody would actually take the time to do that. I'm lazy. I never go in the description box. So you guys have allowed me to um, hit the expenses every month, which is all I'm shooting for. And honestly, I couldn't fucking do it without that. So thank you very much, Love It. It it it's, it is the thought that matters, but also um, thank you for helping me pay for the um, streaming software and the editing software and shit the last few months. It's been nice not taking it out of my own pocket, man. 
Okay. I will unstar that. Again, we're just getting the hang of this. We got Cricket in the background uh, handling all this shit. And we're going to get it, Cricket. I know it. Linda, how are you? You a newbie here? Um, I haven't seen you before. Welcome. Regarding your Dianetics video yesterday. Okay, yes. How long did it take you to stop associating pain with engrams and, and touch assist? I, I know what you mean by the contact assist. We call them touch assist and get rid of that whole frame of thought. How did you do it? That's a fantastic question, which I hope other people that are Scientology lurkers that are currently in the cult, indie Scientologist or any ex cult member would, I hope they get something out of, I hope I can give an answer that will help answer that for them. Cause that's a really, really important question. Remember how I said earlier where I took this really seriously, this is a full-time job to deprogram from Scientology. It wasn't like I was going to go back to regular life. I use my anger, which um, has transformed more today in terms of passion. But let's just say I had a lot of anger when, I mean, that's an understatement. <laughs> when I realized how that this fuckhead conned me, the anger's building as I realized he stole my family, who's now turning on me, and I'm not going to be able to get him back. I was so pissed off at a dead man, L. Ron Hubbard, at what he did to me. And I so didn't understand how the fuck he did that to me that I just full time, I literally, I'm going to go into this in season three, but I worked as little as possible. I mean, I was living in my car. I couch surfed. I went on all sorts of adventures, which were super random, but I needed life experience, man. I needed to be booted out onto the streets. I needed some actual hard experience because I always had the cult and my rich family to go back to if I ever had a problem. So things change when you really have no options and you're just thrust into this shit. So what I did is um, I was so mad. I was never going to compromise. I did try to, mm, I was scared at first to tell my parents about how much I hated Scientology because I knew the consequences. I thought about negotiating with them a couple times, but two years out thereabouts, I hit a point where I'm like, I'm not going to hide this anymore. I'm going to go full time on figuring out what happened to me and then i'm going to get back to acting because i'm so fucked up i'm and it's such a i don't even know how to explain it my friend like i don't know what the hell's happening like one day i believe in hubbard and these policies and the next day the very policies that i thought were good are now going to be used against me now i'm the suppressive person but how the hell was i ever going to be a suppressive person that was somebody that was going to leave scientology or speak out about it and i was never going to do that i was never going to leave scientology never and i thought people that did because I heard stories were fucking foolish. It would just be like a Christian saying, why did that person go over to the devil? You know, it's like that ridiculous about that you'd ever like, you know, leave. So when that happened, um, I took it so personally that I just said, I'm going to work, uh, make as much money as I need to hit the rent and the basics, but I want as much time to read books, to get an education and my daily interactions with people, you know, where you just walk around normally in life. My life was intense for about 10 years. So I was intently listening to people. I was learning how to not stare at them. It was like a, a, a school of life where it wasn't just like waking up and stretching. Like I was in PTSD mode where um, I was having amazing revelations just by talking to people, to friends in the grocery store. Like I said, they were mirroring to me because I'm in this new world now where the programming's breaking down. They're mirroring to me um, what real emotions look like. I'm, a conversation at the grocery store where I would just, you know, really be listening to whatever th they would offer me opinions that I'd never heard before because I'd never listened. I'm in this bubble world. Like almost every conversation was amazing. And I would tell people like literally strangers that I would just say, hey, so I see that some uh, mashed potatoes you're getting there. And the next thing you know, you're in a conversation, you know, on aisle 10. I've had a million of those conversations where I would just like almost hug the person for having a conversation with me in the real world for being for mirroring shit to me that they didn't even know they were doing. And they'd look at me like, yeah, no problem. So that's, I'm just trying to paint a picture of how seriously I took not doing the stare, getting this asshole shit out of my brain, studying books on how to do this. Uh, we showed, I don't, I don't have it where I can grab it, but the main book that launched all this was Steve Hassan, um, who really showed me how deep the rabbit hole goes on book one. I didn't go the indie Scientology route. I was out right away, which I don't think happens to a lot of people. And like I said, until I could get my mind back and find out what happened, I can't act. I can't function. 
I'm having nightmares. I was up all the time. I couldn't sleep and I was dying inside. And like I said, the very people that I needed to actually be there most when I most needed them almost drove me to suicide and would have been happy, I think. And I, uh, I hate to say that about my parents, but honestly, um, Scientologists in general and my parents were no different and I was no different. You're so unaffected by death and it's such a, an, an irrelevance. This is just one lifetime. This is just a father and daughter son, you know, game that we're playing here. It's not serious. So my parents, I think, uh, during that time when I was most needing them and bashing Scientology and saying, mom, fuck man, don't you see it's happening? They would have been very happy and were pushing me towards suicide as sick as that sounds. You know, my best friend, Nick Lashaway, who died at 28 when he was pulling out of Scientology, his mom, you know, wouldn't admit it or say it, but let's just say the funeral of my best friend was all about her. Um, she was an indie Scientologist that never took responsibility for fucking raising her son in this shit. And that's why he's probably, uh, contributed to his death. There's a, such a cold heartedness in Scientology concerning death that, um, um, it's just, I don't know. You're bringing back so many memories, Linda, and clearly I'm stoned, but I think we're almost wrapping up on the question. Um, so how long, let me get my train of thought back here. That's a long winded way of saying, um, I took it seriously. I did, like I said, I did it full time every, you know, every, I learned how to live frugally. I had unbelievable adventures, which I needed to have. So I wouldn't be such a pussy in life. Like I said, and I mean, you know, all these problems, you know what we were talking about earlier where people get offended. If you say the word gal, you don't call the right pronouns, all this crazy shit, man, that's come into the world, uh, just in the last X amount of years. When I was growing up, A, it wasn't like that. And B, all these petty problems, man, like I didn't get the acting job. God damn it. Why didn't I get a call back? Like all the normal, like human problems, that shit went right the fuck out the window. I mean, I actually had a real problem. So worrying about all the bullshit that I used to worry about before and being out of that all these years later, so much stuff about people say they're offended or you got to take a drug every time you have an emotion you don't like all this crazy shit, like on the other side of this. And that's why I'm thankful for uh, go, getting on the other side of this fucking thing without killing myself. I mean, the, the one thing I did get out of the experience is it certainly um, just made all the trite, petty shit that, that I and other people get involved in absolutely irrelevant when it comes to the bigger questions. And, you know, I feel like I definitely got a purpose out of this um, experience. I thought my life was going to be about feeding my kind of ego drive to be a famous actor so my parents and my friends will like me and the bullies that used to pick on me in school will see how cool I am in television. And that was driving me for a long period of time. But the uh, other aspect of that, where I really had to grow up by getting booted out of the cult, by losing all my petty, you know, irrelevant problems and having to deal with real problems that actually matter. And even speaking out about this shit and the positive emails, the feedback, the help that I get from you guys, it's been far more satisfying than any acting, the previous life that I had, even when I was in Scientology, just worrying about all this bullshit. So long story short, um, okay, so I'm still rambling. So the contact assist, the engrams, that whole way of thinking about the reactive mind, that all got replaced by learning about the subconscious mind, studying Freud and Jung and a million other authors that I'm sure you guys have already studied to get a framework that would automatically allow me to juxtapose Hubbard's bullshit, or is it bullshit? against where he stole it from. So we've done a whole video breakdowns on, I mean, literally a hundred percent of what he created is stolen. So once you realize what that is and you read all those authors, I was able to make up my mind automatically. Do I keep Hubbard's theory on engrams? Is the reactive mind real? Are there past lives? I mean, these are, I got a lot of questions stimulated by this smorgasbord uh, in this mind control machine. So in a positive way, you know, I thought that I wanted to know the answers and the truth, and I thought I was going spiritual in Scientology. But like I said before, it's a it's a it's a narcissistic spiritualism. It's a spiritual bypass. You're basically avoiding pain and just getting hypnosis highs and trying to be a smiley, happy person the whole time and stay up the tone scale. But the real adventure is to you know lean into your emotions and shit. I um. Oh my god, I'm so fucking rambling. I'm so sorry. We. Can we hit another fucking Xenu so I can get on course here? I'm just going to end off this question because I'm, I'm making a long statement about um, a, a simple thing. Oh, you didn't have to move it yet. Now I'm really going to forget it, Cricket. 
But long story short, and why I'm a little overboard on some of the ex community about being so fucking culty, censoring people. Now you have to pick sides. Everything's black and white. It was through a very dedicated process of uh, really wanting to know the truth. And I was more motivated getting out of Scientology and having to find that out to get back with my normal life, which I never went back to because it changed me. I thought I wanted to know the truth in Scientology, but I was dead serious about, I want to know the truth, whatever it turns out to be. I'll be an atheist. I don't have to believe in past lives. I'll be a fucking Satanist if that turns out, you know, what the truth is. Did you guys ever see that South Park episode where all the different religious believers are in hell? There's like a Mormon and a Christian and this and that. And Satan comes out on the stage. This is like when they're in the afterlife or in hell or wherever they're at. And it turns out Satan comes out and he's like, Mormonism, that was the correct religion. And all the other religious believers that aren't Mormons are like, oh, fuck, man. You know what I'm talking about? It, it's like, it's that concept, which I was trying to um, say that I thought I will, I will accept it if it's Mormonism. I will accept whatever it is. Whereas in Scientology, you create your own reality. Um, you don't have to pay attention to bending to what the truth actually is. You can bypass all that and just create in your own imagination whatever the hell you want life to be. I found out that's a very incorrect way to go about it. I will accept what the truth is. I will, um, I, I want, I really want to know, uh, now getting out of the cult. And by the way, um, I don't want to preach here, man, but I swear to God, like that really is the greatest gift because I feel like it's a rare opportunity because, you know, you grow up, you get your parents' subconscious passed on to you, you go through the schooling system. There's just so many influences where what, and then you get locked into a job or some shit. You just, it just happens, right? Life just happens, right? But growing up in a cloistered environment and then halfway through life, you know, in my mid thirties being forced to change in a way where I had to reevaluate everything. It, it's, um, it's not something I don't think that happens. They call it like a midlife crisis. It was an extreme midlife crisis. But man, if you can ever self-induce it or, or you um, ever tried that, it's amazing how much you find out about what you thought you believed is not true. Um, it's amazing how you can change. And you like I feel like I got free because of being in a mind control cult and then having to work myself out of it. And that didn't involve attaching to any religion or anything. It was just literally setting my mind free by realizing I had an opportunity, even though I felt like a stupid age regressed six-year-old because of my level of knowledge, it was a great gift and opportunity. Um, and to, to reassess everything that you've ever believed halfway through life and find out, um, how free you really aren't and then how free you could actually be. And also it removed fear, which is the number one, like controller. That's what kept me bowing down to my family and the cult and shit. But you know, I would have fear if someone put a gun to my head. Uh, that's a natural body reaction. But I don't fear death. I don't fear, um, you know, all. I used to be very afraid. I just, I. it's great to live without fear. And how many people could actually say that? You know what I mean? I'm not talking about the fear of, um, you know, you can be a, a brute. You know, you can be physically dominant and beat the shit out of someone. I'm talking about moral courage. I'm talking about where you actually can stand up to what you believe is right, no matter what anybody else says around you. Like getting out of Scientology, for example, as hard as it was, taught me that it doesn't matter if everybody around me is against what I know to be right and true, whether it's my family, the cult leaders, you know, I lost all my friends. There is, um, there is a, it's worth it because the fear that, that go, the fear that was there, it was all fake. It was all an illusion. Like Scientology is terrifying if you believe in it. And it can be terrifying getting out of it because you have to work yourself out of it once you get captured. But once you make it on the other side and you look at it now, it's ridiculous. It's funny. I mean, it would be funny if it wasn't so damaging. Like, it's so ludicrous. It's so fake. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I would totally be laughing and doing prank calls all the time like we did last week if it wasn't actually harming people. So it's it's funny on the outside and there's nothing to fear. Um but it's not that way on the inside. So we have to, I guess, keep trying to um, just talk about it. So other people have the opportunity to have a great gift where they don't know what they're missing, man. And if we do have any Scientology lurkers or OSA or anybody, it sucks to go through the initial loss of the family, the PTSD and all the connections you have in the cult. 
but you can get through it. And on the other side, I promise you, it's so worth it. You would look back and go, just like I do almost every day. It's like looking at another person. I know what happened, but I'm like, how on earth was I that person? What a small minded, limited perception, narcissistic, selfish, not free piece of shit. I really was. And it was all fake. Like I could have stepped out of it. Um, anytime I wanted to. Okay. Jesus, I got to lay off the weed, man. Cause we're not going to get through any of these questions. And I, I'm so sorry for the long, long ramble. Okay. So we covered that one, Linda extensively. I probably didn't even answer your question. Did I, but the way that I did it is just through, um, through what I just described. You definitely re-stimulated me on that one, my friend. And I mean that in a good way. Just to tag on to that real quick. I do use Scientology words. Like I'm sure re-stimulates a real word, but it has specific meaning in Scientology. I do use the real words um, in the streams and sometimes with X's because it's funny. But I don't think in these, in these terms at all. I do have the human translation, generally speaking, in my brain. But I've even gotten criticized for that in this ever so pussifying world where everybody's offended by everything or even if i joke around or do the elron voice and throw in the word restimulation people are like you're still talking like a scientologist uh you said you deprogram whatever <laughs> jesus i gotta let this go man but it's just amazing like realizing how offended people get by everything like increasing by the day and it was so so different when i was growing up okay could there be something going on there do you think Rosebud, Amy, question, Doug, when did you start acting and what age did you join Scientology? Again, friends, sorry, we're putting out questions we've already covered, but it's not crickets bad. It's my bad. I have to unstar them when we're done. Okay, philosophy. Doug, I've started to understand the way the language is used in the hypnosis, programming, and psychosis, but can you explain more about the tone of voice, how it's used? Good question. I mean, that's pretty simple philosophy. And I know you already know this stuff, but you always ask these good questions for the rest of us. You know, it has a, uh, if you listen to Hubbard's voice, I found it very soothing and I liked listening to it. Um, when I was in the cult, now I can barely stand it. But have you noticed how Keith Ranieri, how Hubbard, how certain salesmen, this is why we have advertisers that talk in a certain voice. I don't know how exactly it works philosophy, but if you have a rhythmic, soothing voice, Somehow that probably matches up with the brain waves, the brain chemistry to help induce and lull the trance. So there's definitely something about, well, we know with NLP, it's the way they structure the sentences and me and Marilyn are going to do a video all on that. And I'm sure you know about that, but we're not, not only the way you structure the sentence, right? To induce the hypnosis with NLP, but the accents that you use on when you say the sentence, how you deliver it. And then the very hypnotic voice that some people have. And if you listen to Hubbard, he had, it may be weird. It's definitely creepy to listen to, but once you go under in the communication course or something, that voice, man, he has one of the best hypnotic voices I've ever heard. He has a very unusual way of speaking. He is trained in all that shit from hypnotism to NLP. When that became in fashion, he knew all this shit. I think half of his, um, crazy, unusual, Hitler-esque mannerisms uh, was, is from being on drugs, from being an expert in knowing how to speak and how to use that unique voice of his, if, you know, if you want to call it that, and how to have stage mannerisms that would pull people in. I'm no expert philosophy. I don't know, you know, I'm not a psychologist um, and I don't know how the brain works, but it definitely, if you want to be a good cult leader, a really good first step is to have the right voice and to learn how to speak in a soothing way. Cause you can put people to sleep like a lullaby just with your um, voice. Alonzo, do you second that or not? Question for HG tutor. Well, first of all, you got to start calling him by his right name. It's HG tutor cricket. I'm good on the questions, man. I totally got it, man. Um, so what if these beliefs about narcissists had no objective evidence to support them? Are we just creating a culture? that demeans self-esteem how many of you guys know who alonzo is if you do put it in the chat i'd like to hear your opinion this guy is a, a, a unaware narcissist and he um he's not osa by the way he's just a jackass and uh by the way i kind of like his style too because he'll call out jeffrey augustine like he definitely calls out the controlled opposition but he he's like a scientologist apologist you know like we were talking about earlier where 
he really still believes in these concepts and he doesn't believe there's any th such thing as brainwashing and probably not least because he is a narcissist himself unaware he probably wouldn't accept the idea that there is such a thing as narcissism known as antisocial personality disorder in the dsm i mean it's it's uh, been proven that psychopathy is a real thing but i've had so many conversations with this guy where it doesn't matter how much you talk to him he's so set in in beliefs like this and his way of thinking as if it's totally right and everybody else around him is wrong that it's hard to take this guy seriously but it's good to see you again alonzo i hear you're making a movie i just saw your um i just saw your trailer that um that was sent to me okay yeah please chow just told me she has to go pee i totally got this chow you got you've done such a great job i got all the uh questions lined up Anyways, Alan, I look real forward to seeing that fucking movie, man. I haven't seen you trolling for a while, so I miss you. Okay, what next? By the way, being a narcissist, that's going to really piss him off. Like, he's going to go bonkers over that. He'll probably, like, make some blog post, you know, about look at what Doug said. And it's just going to be funny to watch this guy scramble around. Okay, Linda, question regarding your Dianetics video. How long did it take you? To okay, sorry, man. I got to start unstarring these. Damn it. Okay. Cindy, my neighbor met Corey while she and her husband were at a nudist resort. She said he is a wonderful person and funny as hell. Corey, okay, this is something Cricket threw up. Um, that obviously was way earlier in the conversation. Sorry, I'm not following, but I assume it was a great comment was made. Okay, Faye, you're really going to push us to the limits here. We've been going for about an hour. You guys want to hang out for like another half hour or something? Because I, if, if Faye keeps getting us high... Um, you can see how I'm already rambling early on, but fuck it, let's do it. Thank you, Faye, right on time. So this is where we do the um, Xenu slash Marlene thing when anybody puts the word Xenu and I learn how to actually frame it properly here on the goddamn screen. We all take a hit of our favorite poison, mine being 34% THC weed uh, uh, called ice cream cookies. Chow is still on a bathroom break. I can see her in the backstage, but she missed her opportunity to partake. Welcome back, Cricket. Okay. Love it. Hey, Doug, where did you move to LA from? Um, <coughs> <coughs> Damn. Camaro, California. It's about an hour on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Um, other cities that are more recognizable that are close to that are Ventura and kind of Santa Barbara. So I wasn't far. That's the one thing I told my parents is like, as a kid, I'm like, I want to act. We don't have to move there. It's only an hour away. I'm lucky enough to live an hour away. Can I get an agent and start auditioning? I mean, it was totally feasible. I, you know, my parents thought I was joking. They're like, come on, kid, you're dreaming or whatever. Um, but it really fucked me up that because I knew what I wanted to do early in life. And I, I, I didn't really need to go the normal route. I really did feel like that was my calling early on. And I, I wanted to do it. So we were only an hour away, but she would not allow me to get an agent or audition. And it caused a massive riff in the family. That's where a shitload of anger came from, from the ages of uh, 12. When I told you guys, I saw Ricky Schroeder and first wanted to do it all the way up till um, high school. I constantly um, was angry at them for, um, and then also taking the burden on myself. Cause I go, well, yeah, I understand. I mean, I'm just in, in high school and junior high. It's, I don't want to burden my parents. They have to drive a fucking hour there, an hour back. You know, I get, I would, I get the fact of why they would say that. And maybe I'm being selfish by like, who the fuck do I think I am? Like genuinely needing to do acting at that age and needing my mom to just help me out here. Cause this is what I want to fucking do for the rest of my life. That caused so much fucking anger that they never um, understood. And by the way, even when I did make it and I was making decent money, my parents would still, they're the opposite of me, man. They're like totally left brain. So they don't take any chances. They believe in what they're told. And it's just a dream to them to be an actor. For me, it was, it was guaranteed, man. I just got to stick it out. I fucking believed in it. I didn't give a fuck what the statistics were. So even when I actually made it, because they're always like, when are you going to get a real job and this and that? Doug, you're on year fucking nine. Now it's year 10. It's not quite happening. You know, we got in a few parts, but what? And then finally, when I like hit it, they still said like, and I was making a good living. They're like, when are you going to get a job? I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, my parents are never going to understand. They're never going to accept that I do this. And they're never going to 
actually realize why there was so much anger in the family all centered around acting and the fucking Scientology cult? All right, great question. Pete, what's going down? Your favorite restaurant in LA that's not pre pretentiously Hollywood. Uh, what the fuck is the name of that place? It's been so long since I've been to it. Um, there's this place, Pete, that we used to go to in um, right after acting class. It would end like at you know two or three a.m. in the morning. This is Bobby Lyons' acting class. These like epic five hour classes that he'd put on like five times a week. One time at his house would be a cold reading class for fucking five hours. Another time it would be you know um, scene study. It was um it was a restaurant that we'd all go hang out at half Scientologist half people we were trying to convert in the class that weren't Scientologists but knew we were, and we would so many nights man just hanging out at this restaurant that was nobody knew about totally unpretentious, it's where the bikers and shit would hang out late at night, and we were allowed to smoke. It's when the world was less pussified, so you could actually smoke you know like anywhere, and I mean can you believe that you can't even smoke in a restaurant nowadays like it's so crazy like. I'm one of the last like smokers out here in LA, which actually gives me a little bit of pride, like because um, I like smoking, but one of the funniest things is it drives people nuts. Like I don't tell them what to do or, you know, I take good care of myself or whatever. And sometimes some enormous fat ass, you know, will just come up to me and tell me about my health because I'm smoking a cigarette. Uh, as if um, I just like the fact that every time I light up in LA, especially at acting class, there's people that are walk away and go, Pfft. Oh, and just make sure that they're heard, you know, the smoke. I don't know. There's something funny about just how silly and uh, like I said, offended people could be by stuff that, you know, it's kind of ridiculous that I do get half of my pleasure from the tobacco and half of the pleasure from the reactions that it causes from people when I light a cigarette. See if you can feel your reaction personally as I light this and let us know in the comments how you feel as I'm about as this suppressive person this evil man is about to damage his lungs okay that's the answer to my quick favorite restaurant ciao we can't have you moving those off man because i forget the questions so you've done your job for tonight i have them all up i wish i had more for you to do but we'll figure out a way where you can throw up comments without removing the questions but i got to keep them up here the whole time so you literally have nothing else to do except in if you want to engage with the chat um like, you know, because you have mod shit too, Cricket. So you can throw links in there. You can say hi to people. I guess we just, we're going to have to figure out how you can throw other comments up. But for now, okay, you got it. Marilyn, what's going down? If you guys haven't seen or know who Marilyn is, she's a lovely, lovely lady. And talk. remember we were talking earlier about what you have to go through when you get out of a cult. And I'm sure Marilyn would concur. You go through a whole transformation and you become much stronger on the other side. And Marilyn is testament to that. And we've done, she told her whole life story in two um, epic interviews, which I'll link in the description box when we're done. But um, I just love her, man. And she, her story wasn't related to Scientology. It was a Pentecostal-esque cult, um, just showing that they come in all shapes and, 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 you know, sizes. And that's just one aspect of Marilyn's life. So you talk about um, having experience that enriches you and makes you a deeper person there's like nothing she fucking hasn't been it's just good to see you marilyn i'm happy you're around did you say marilyn we already said this man you must have just been joining in like fuck it we'll do it again just because when you say it we have to do it but we just got fucked up five minutes ago but since you're just joining us let's do another um xenu marlene actually that was probably from a long time ago marilyn i'm really not tracking on the questions here because i'm so far behind hawthorne haven't seen you for a while man how you been good to see you what effect do you think Scientology has had on the quality of movies from Hollywood? Interesting question. I think the quality has gone down. Is it, that's a, that's a, is it partially because of Scientology? I have no idea, my friend. I'd never thought about that. That's a good question. What do you guys think? Like to, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, we know that Battlefield Earth was a piece of shit, but that, you know, and that was obviously a Scientology movie based on the novel. We know that, uh, you know, Bowfinger kind of took off from Scientology. There's even a Scientology quip in Repo Man. So they provided plenty of comedy, um, either intentionally or unintentionally. Their influence in Hollywood, I would say, is waning, but it's not irrelevant like people try to make it. They still have a very good foothold, not only in Hollywood, but politicians are in their pocket. They safe point uh, police forces and pe people on the police forces all over the world. They're like an intelligence agency. So um, I would imagine that 
the effect is probably more than I know or had the information or, or could guess because um, just because of how they roll in the political and Hollywood and, and elite uh, departments. But in the way of what we can see, just a bunch of junk movies that they put out, um, they don't have the same pull. So you don't have to necessarily bend down in Hollywood to what a Scientologist says like you used to. Oh, I'll tell you a quick story about this. Because Juliet Lewis was represented by the agent that I signed with, this big agent that I got with finally, uh, right before I woke up out of the cult and everything changed. But let me tell you a story about that. This will give you some idea, I guess, this is from personal experience. So I was with a uh, agency called Don Buckwald and Associates. I think that they might emerge and, and changed or whatever, but they were this enormous agency in Century City. And I met with them and got with them. And then um, they about two, all I could talk about to them was Scientology because I was super traumatized. I could barely do the meeting and my dreams are finally happening. But I had woken up by this point. This is 2000. Mm, 2008, 2009, when I got with this agency, I had just snapped out of the cult, right? So um, about two weeks into it, since I would not shut up about Scientology, they, um, my point agent named Spencer, I don't want to throw his last name out, but his name's Spencer. And he said, um, hey, this is an unusual request. I know we've just been representing you for two weeks, but you know, you, you talk a lot about Scientology and um, and I say, sorry, sorry, man. I'm trying to focus on the audition. He's like, no, no, it's fine, dude. He's like, would you mind meeting with all of us at lunch, all the agents, because we have a client named Juliet Lewis. She's speaking some crazy shit. He didn't tell me this over the phone, but this is what, um, what the meeting was about. <clears throat> he just said, you know, we like to ask you some questions about one of our clients, Juliet Lewis. What it turned out is all the agents, they wanted me to translate the Scientologies that Juliet was doing. They wanted to understand why she was such a pain in the ass to work with. And they knew it was related to Scientology in the way of how she selected roles or whatever, right? They went into detail. So they used me as a Scientology trans translator because Juliet was big at the time. They don't want to lose her as a moneymaker, but they said she was the biggest pain in the ass. One of them, because there's a lot that they had at Buckwald. So um, that's some, of, I, I don't know if that answers what influence they have, but there was a point not that many years ago when you know, agents have to do what their Scientology client says, and they were willing to take one of their newest clients, buy me lunch, and um, they cared enough about keeping Juliet, the Scientologist, even though they didn't really like her, um, to sit me down and, and pick my brain for an hour. That's just a random story that doesn't really totally answer your question. Sorry about that, man. Stacy, would you speak on the influence of Jack Parsons? We got to save that for another video because that's a huge story. Um, we've done so many videos on this too, and I'll link them in the description box, Stacy. But let's see. So Jack Parsons is covered in part one and part two of the Summer of PsyOps episodes, which I'll link. It's covered in the true history of L. Ron Hubbard, something along those lines, which I'll link. We've gone into a lot of detail, not just on Parsons, but that whole surrounding counterculture era there's nothing to add that's not on those videos, but just briefly, I'm sure you already know this. I mean, he was the guy that L Ron Hubbard, and we don't really know to this day how the fuck this happened right when he got out of the service, he just magically appears at Parsons house. He had a um, hand me down mansion from his family. He was a rich boy. Um, and he was into the occult and he also happened to be a genius, uh, rocket science scientist. And he would only have, um, a atheist, eclectic hippies, occultists and you know weirdos at his house Hubbard appears steals his girlfriend does black magic rituals with him goes out in the desert and hallucinates and sees the moon child I, there's all sorts of shit that we've covered but he was basic that wasn't even totally correct but i've just told the story so many times i mean we'd be here for an hour talking about this fascinating man but he's in a nutshell he's the guy that um hubbard burned there's a whole lot more to actually say about that because you know, what, what the fuck was Hubbard even doing there? Scientology's official line is that he was there to break up a black magic ring. That's not true. And then the other viewpoint is he was just, uh, you know, a black magician himself to steal Parsons girlfriend. You know, Mike Rinder said it was just a ruse and Hubbard dropped the black magic, you know, after that and all that shit. Um, no, I don't think it's like that at all. I think that, uh, well, we'll have to cover that for another story, but you know, Scientology basically operates like an intelligence agency. It's not a religion or even a business or even a hypnosis machine. It's an intelligence gathering agency, which is why 
they have all the stars and politicians and certain police officers and stuff in their pocket because that's it's like an Epstein-esque thing in a certain way. It's a way to control people by getting um, intelligence or information. This is why data mining and you know advertisers are always after information. And Hubbard um, basically operated that way. So my explanation is he wasn't just working alone. Um, he avoided prison, you know, despite Operation Snow White and all this other crazy shit. He went around all the different countries in different disguises and stuff got booted out of certain countries for being accused of being CIA. He always, and then formed the Sea Org in 1967 and went out on the ocean. It operates more like an off book intelligence agency, which explains, you know, why he was there with Parsons. Um, and we'll go into another uh, video about that, but that's a huge, huge rabbit hole. We've covered most of it, but if you want to get into the Hubbard intelligence connections, Jack Parsons and all that. I, I think we do have another video there. So thanks for reminding me of that, man. He's a fucking fascinating character. And there's a, um, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's pretty good, but it's not totally accurate. There's a document or a movie on him called Strange Angel, which is worth checking out. Do you still act audition? No, man, I haven't for a while. Up until the pandemic, I went to acting class multiple times a week. I was always planning on going back professionally. Uh, I went through quite a bit of transition while being locked in my house for about two years out here. So that a lot of things have changed because of the pandemic and my personal headspace and what I want to do. And if I even want to go back to Hollywood, but, um, I wasn't auditioning, but I was acting this entire time. So I woke up in 2008. I worked professionally up until mm, maybe 2010 because I went full time and my life was falling apart and I couldn't fucking focus on professional shit, but I did go to acting class as my therapy. That was my psychotherapy. You know, I did go to psychotherapists. I spent more time explaining to them how fucking cults work and shit when they want to go back to childhood. I finally learned to do auto psychotherapy. It's just what I decided to do. I'm not telling people don't go see a therapist. Maybe I need one or whatever, but I was just going to uh, work it out for myself. Not least because I needed to learn how to think for myself too. So I was, I used acting, um, and I thought it would take about two years to act out my trauma, the new emotions that I, extreme emotions that I was experiencing. So I wouldn't kill my family. I wouldn't blow up the cult headquarters and I wouldn't suicide myself because that's how extreme it was. So I recognized early on, I can't focus professionally right now. I didn't even try to pull back. I just wouldn't shut up about talking about Scientology to my agents, man. I think they got sick of it. They never dropped me. It's just, I was so focused. I wanted to just get everything else out of the way so I could read books. I had 10 tabs open on my computer about mind control and all this shit. Like this was what I was into, man, because I figured the faster I go on working this out so I can function, then I can go back to acting and doing what I love doing. So I wasn't auditioning from 2010 up until um, well, all the way up to now I did get offers, but I pushed it away. My therapy was my acting class. And then I was planning, you know, I finally got my mind screwed back on in 2019. I had an agent, I had the headshots done and then we all got locked in our house again. And I felt like I was back in the Scientology cult. So a lot changed during that time. Maybe I will go back. Um, I am in a transitional phase. YouTube's not my life, man. This is like, well, it's more than a hobby because I really do care about it. Um, it's not my bread and butter, obviously. Um, but this has been way more than a full-time job and a hell of a lot, um, harder and more, uh, rewarding than, you know, act pretty much anything I've done actually. I mean, I didn't know how to edit. I'm not a, I hate social media even to this day. Um, I didn't know how to, I didn't even have a fucking TV. So I had to learn everything from scratch. So this, this shit's been like super challenging and unbelievably rewarding where I kind of forgot about the acting and shit, but I think that I'm in a transitional phase and I, I probably will go back to that, but I have a bone to pick with Hollywood. I'm not sure I could do that without selling my soul inadvertently a second time. So there's a, there's a conundrum there too. Alonzo, the narcissist, narcissist and Q and a agent here. Your demo reel is one of the best I've seen. See, now he's love bombing me guys. After I laid into him, this is exactly how he works. Alan, if you want to even come on or make more comments like this, we can use you as a case study, a real life example in narcissism. Um, we have a history, you know, I go back, this guy comes into my life every, like he's not getting enough tension, right? In the ex community. And he likes to stir up drama and he'll run away for a while. And then he'll like come back into my life. 
And I always allow them to love bomb me like you're seeing here. This is like a real life example that you guys are seeing right here live. And I'm not, I'm not joking or making this up. This guy is an unaware narcissist. I have him sussed as that. Again, I'm not diagnosing anybody, but in my life, all I need to know is that if I believe that. So this guy we have, I have a history with, he um, comes in every once in a while, catches me off guard. I foolishly um, trust him and believe him. And then he uses others in the X community, like my work or anybody else's work to make articles about, to focus the attention on him. And he's pissed off so many people, including Zero Dark Tony. Not that that's hard to do, but this guy was kissing Zero Dark Tony's ass, man. He's just trying to, you know, love bomb everybody and get everybody to like him. And he even pissed off his, his like hero, Zero Dark Tony, and went on like a big rant or whatever. So Alan's back. He's got a new movie trailer that he just posted today, which someone sent me, all about his life as an ex-Scientologist. And I think we're going to be seeing more of him because he just started creeping back in the comment section. I feel his need to get admiration and to create drama is like, has gone, he's gone without fuel, as HG would say, for too long. So Alan, welcome back, sir. Always fun to play with you. <laughs> he's also created a lot of problems too, where <laughs> I'll give you an example. Like Dana um, of Rotting Jewels accused me on a stream the other night of giving out her phone number. Like she said it flat out. I never gave out Dana's phone number. I wouldn't give out anybody's phone number. And she, this is when we were, this is interesting. So when we were feeling out Zero Dark Tony, he came into the community, started talking all this shit, some right, some not, about ex community members. Um, it all kind of fired off when we started, when we did that controlled opposition video. And then all of a sudden he jumps on the bandwagon and starts talking shit about like everybody. And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to focus on Karen Daly Carrier and Jeffrey Augustine and a few other people here. So he made it, Zero Dark Tony is a guy that made his bread and butter the last few months, just literally making videos every day about people in the X community. Half of me is cheering him on because a lot does need to be exposed. The other half, he himself is, I'd say, is a narcissist and he's disgusting to listen to. And he's just all about He's funny and then he's complete. I can't literally listen to his shit. But the point being is he works in cahoots with this chick named Dana, who's known as Rotting Jewels, where she likes thinks she's conspiracy. Like she's like putting out all this information on the process church and shit. Shit we've talked about. I don't give a fuck, man. I just think she's stealing shit because like we've already talked about this shit years ago on the channel. And then right when that controlled opposition video comes out, she pops out of nowhere and she's like supposedly like, you know, the authority on all this shit. She's just fucking it all up. And it's all like. She's out of her league, no offense. So she fucking, but I've been looking for someone that's in the X community that's gone beyond just the fucking Scientology narrative. And we can talk about the bigger picture. So I liked what Dana was putting out. This is months ago when they're both new on the scene. And I like what Zero Tar Tony was kind of doing. We're feeling these people out, right? So Dana gave me her number through Tony. And she said, you're the only ex-Scientologist I trust. They're all fucking corrupt. Uh, when can you talk? So I was in the middle of fighting off all this bullshit after putting up Over the Rainbow and the Controlled Opposition video. Marcus Sawyer turned on me, which I've never spoken out about, and he's played the victim card. And mind you, I was a little mean to him, but there's an explanation behind that. Let's just say a lot of uh, trusted friends uh, kind of did me dirty um, and created a lot of havoc. So I told Dana, I'm in the middle of a storm here, which I knew was going to happen. Can I call you back in a week? I really want to talk to you. I really like what you've been putting out. Long story short, I call her. I get this text back hours later. She doesn't answer. And it was real curt and real short. Don't think we should work together. Take care. It wasn't exactly that, but it was about three short sentences. And I was like, what the fuck? Long story short, Alan Alonzo got in the way. Dana had this whole conspiracy where she um, got calls from somebody after I called. I'm the only one that knows her number. So she assumes from whatever conspiracy she has in her head that I gave out her number when I absolutely did not. I gave it out to no one. Why would I do that, by the way? So she unfriended me that day, sent me that cursed curt text, and it's been spreading rumors for the last few months, which I only found out by accidentally watching one of her videos the other night and then calling her out on it and seeing what a biot she is and how she skirted around the issue. The other night she said, um, you know, 
you gave out somebody said in her comment section on on this video that she's doing on you know sps used as psyops or some bullshit um she said um yeah he gave out my number and i checked the chat and it was in reference to me so i wrote in the in the comments why the fuck would you say something like that i gave your boy zero dark tony a fair shot i've never lied or made up bullshit about you guys some of what you do i like some i don't i know you don't totally like me but i don't stoop to making up lies especially on live streams so i said why did you do that and again she gave me some whole conspiracy explanation and shit and long story short she took no, no responsibility somehow became the victim blamed it on alonzo who does fucking get in the way of shit like he tried to you know i i wanted to talk to dana and he made it his business remember how we're with hg tutor we're talking about how they um, have kind of no originality, but they bolt on characteristics from other people or they leech the work. Well, Alan goes around and Dana was no different where I had to find out through him that he had followed her on Twitter and, and involved this shit where Dana rightfully so thinks, oh, Doug and Alan are working together and they're trying to set up a meeting when that was all Alan's doing. And when I talked to him, when I trusted him after he came back into my life, you know, because he wasn't buttoning in and he promised not to, he's doing all this shit behind you know, trolling Dana and shit. Dana thinks it's me. And this is the kind of shit that narcissist and Alan does. Um, one to be, to be wary of this guy. Cause I, I think he's coming back in the community. We see him here tonight Two, This is how he rolls. I have personal experience. Uh, three people don't pay him much attention anyways, cause he's irrelevant. He is an ex Scientologist. That story is true. He's not Osa. Uh, I, I will accept it if he is, but I don't, don't accuse him of being Osa. People can just be narcissists and jackasses um, without being OSA, even without being an ex-Scientologist. But it's it's just good to have you you back, um, Alan, because you, um, you're a piece of work, man. So, Gabrielle, Doug, do you... So I hope that... It, thanks for letting me get that off, by the way, because, man, these motherfuckers, like, you know, it's one thing to talk shit about the ex-Scientology community, um, half of which I can get behind as long as it's done accurately and not with like hate and like, you know, these Tony and Dana thinking they're, they have everything right. Talking out of both sides of their mouth. Like you gotta be accurate with the shit you say, man, these guys just sling off shit. You know, I asked Dana, you know, um, a normal person would apologize or, you know, maybe mention on the next stream that you made a mistake. You know, I, cause that's a rumor that I now get emails about, you know, Hey, I heard that you gave the number to Dana. So now people you know, Tony's on his stream the other day because I had to go check his shit out. Like, what else are they talking about? He's like, oh, yeah, Doug's not a good guy. You can't trust him because of so-and-so. And it's all fake. It's all rumors spread by fucking Dana. And she wouldn't even give me an apology. She, you know, she's always bitching about how everybody's doing her wrong and never apologize to her. Then when she clearly does something wrong and lies about me, she doesn't say what I would say and a normal person would do. Fuck, dude, I'll totally correct that in the next stream. My bad. I'm sorry. That's why I stopped talking to you. I totally had it wrong doesn't mean we are or aren't going to be friends again, but hey, man, I just wanted to let you know that's why I sent you that nasty text. Not only did I not get any of that back, she is a complete biatch. Anyways, so I, I'm sure I just earned myself another video um, from Tony. And then if Dana can get on get in on my hate video too, that would be awesome because I fucking love watching him. He's done a couple of me on me and not only doesn't offend me, it's like um, I... I would encourage him to do that because they're just fucking hilarious. But I don't lie about uh, these people and I don't, I don't lie about anybody and I make mistakes and I fuck up all the time. But I also say that I'm not trying to con Dana and um, Tony and they're only going to hurt their own credibility because as soon as you start lying or you're two faced or you don't actually practice what you preach, people are going to suss that and you're going to, you, you know, they're going to lose their audience. You know, if Tony wasn't so aggressive and stuck to facts and Dana wasn't a liar, you know, they could have, um, I think they could actually blow up their channels, but they're just, um, they just play dirty, man. Purple groovy. Did I? Okay. There we go. Jesus. We're going, okay. An hour and a half, a couple more of my friends and we'll end off. But damn, that felt so good to say, cause there's so much bullshit rumors that have been spread about, you know, like I said, I lost some friends when I put out that controlled opposition video, cause that's a no go area, but you know, you see who your friends really are when you actually do what you feel is right, but it's like scary to do. And then fucking data lies about me. I just accidentally found that, you know, out and left, left the comment and had comment wars back with her kind of surprised. Like, wow, why wouldn't you just fucking apologize? And then we all know, you know, Tony reeled us in, including Alan, the aforementioned Alonzo, the way we, 
we started being friends again and Alan came back into my life was getting semi jazzed up about what zero dark Tony was talking about. Because like I said, I wanted to tackle this controlled opposition shit, the narrative that's basically, let's just say the full of Scientology, the story never gets to come out because it's just covered by the X org and it's all about kind of content and it's kind of irrelevant in many ways. They're, it's controlled, right? And we got to two of these characters that are behind that, Karen De La Carriere and Jeffrey Augustine. And we only got to video one. Their history goes back to 2010. They completely have apostate Alex in, in their pocket, even though he'll say it's the other way around. Vanessa, all these people, man, like Karen and Jeffrey pay these people money. They help them out. They make content for them. They whisper in their ear. They're narcissists like Alan, man. And as soon as I tried to expose that, like I said, I saw who my real friends were, you know, good people that I trusted, you know, fucking bowed away and slurked away and kind of left me with my dick in my hand. Um, you know, people that I have been very careful um, to not talk shit about, even though I don't totally like them, Dana and Zero Dark Tony, like I gave him credit for letting us know about the Goldie shit. Uh, I, you know, I don't lie about these people. And I just, that's been a long time in coming because I kept my mouth shut and I'm not going to, you know, do a video about Marcus and all that shit. And I know he could pull out messages where I got really pissed at him because he's fucking gaslighting me when I asked him a simple question, but not all the drama needs to be pulled out on the stage. I love that fucking guy. It's sort of a mutual, we forgive each other, but when it comes to like being burned multiple times, whether it's by people that you fucking trust. You know, Dana and Tony, who I've been very careful where I can express my opinions about thinking they're jackasses here and there, and then also give them credit. It's not where they're right. It's not a black and white situation. Find out this fucking asshole does me dirty the other night and then makes it my fault for asking her why the fuck she did that. And just, you know, I'm so rambling, but really this needed to come out because there's a lot of, you guys know I'm pretty transparent here, but there's a lot of stuff I keep to my chest because I don't want to do a drama channel like Zero Dark Tony. I do want to talk more about the controlled opposition because that's the, one of the most important things so you can actually fucking get to taking down Scientology. And there's been a lot of drama that happens that I keep to myself that I don't want to burden people with. But once in a while, it feels good to actually say that out loud so they know where I'm coming from and you guys can fucking hear the truth because I got a bunch of emails when Dana said that. You know, a, that's who alerted me to the video that all of a sudden I'm not trustworthy simply because she's fucking lying. So sorry for, sorry for that, man. I got to stop saying sorry. That felt fucking good. Purple Groovy, do you think that if LRH smoked weed, the policies of Scientology would have been different in a good way? I mean, probably. I mean, yeah, I mean, weed, at least, you know, it, it would have changed his demeanor. It's probably better than doing, you know, speed the whole time and shit while he's doing these lectures. But I still think he was a psychopathic, schizophrenic personality. And I can't really see him being like a stoner or even enjoying weed. I think he, his brain, I'm totally speculating, required something more stimulant and hardcore related to his brain chemistry. Whereas weed, it would mellow him out possibly. And I don't think he, he's, he's, could be, he's a mellow person. I think his brain was going bonkers. Weed would probably be something that you'd have to force onto Hubbard like as a therapy, you know, you'd have to like sp somehow spike it or whatever. But um, I bet you he would have been a lot cooler like a lot of people are that smoke weed. I mean, just take the difference between, for example, weed and alcohol. Alcohol doesn't make everyone into an asshole, but you know, you got the hangover, you got the De Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde complex, you know, my father had that. He scared the shit out of me when he'd drink, even though he never laid a hand on me. But with weed, you just get tired, you be become a better person. And um, Hubbard definitely could have used that, but I think it would have uh, been beneath him. I mean, he's very against weed and LSD too, not least because I think that those two um, could help you snap you out of the trance. And also it would make the gibberish a lot harder to buy into. Rosebud Amy, Doug, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here too, man. I'm still falling behind on the questions. Let me just go to like some of the ones at the end here and then we'll end off because Jesus, we've been gone forever. This has been one hell of a session, man. Thanks. Again, sorry to use the Scientology words. God damn it, he's just a fucking still an indie Scientologist, even though he said he wasn't. Why did he just use that word? Guys, thanks for the session uh, in human terms and for hanging out with me because it's just, um, 
it just seriously helps out, man, especially getting off that last part and holding that in shit, shit forever. Lorna, I'm always left with my dick in my hand. I, for the first time in my life, I'm speechless. I have no response to that. I was going to say something um, that I thought was clever, but I realized it wasn't. I'm always left with my dick in my hand. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have gotten to the end. Damn, Yolanda, you really stumped me with that. Mark, question. Do you think a lot of the never been a Scientologist viewers of SPTV are LARPing a little too hard sometimes? I need to look up the word LARPing. I think I know what it means, but as Aaron says, sometimes it's applicable. I grew up in a cult, so I'm not always familiar with everything. LARPing, playing a LARP is often called LARPing, and one who does it is a LARPer. Gee, that helps. Play overview. The participants in a LARP physically portray characters in a fictional setting. Jesus Christ. What the fuck does LARPing mean? When someone is pretending to be something, they're not. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, 100% is the answer to your question. In fact, um, again, I don't want to spill people's personal information that doesn't need to be out here, but there are several good people in this community where we do have talks about this, about how kind of culty now this might be for any youtube uh subculture but in scientology in particular it's gotten so about views content there's a million different creators there's so many fucking clout goblins that's something i will give zero dark tony credit for he aptly called apostate alex the clout goblin i mean you know whatever you think of that or not that man wants to be fucking number one and that's a sickness that's taken over the community that didn't used to be there at all back in the old days when we had people like Arnie Lerma. Um, you know, we the the real IES protest was when you had people like William and John McGee, you know, these fucking people that would like drink a pint and then, you know, it was a lot more organic. And God bless Aaron for kicking off a lot of channels. But what's come with that is so much clout bullshit that makes me want to vomit everybody's getting in on it it's like the new thing and the message and the cause gets almost completely drowned out um and it did not used to be like that so there's a ton of people that's not everybody but a ton of people are larping are using it to make money and to be youtube famous and all the stupid ass shit and um it, it's, it's become culty People will censor comments. They wouldn't talk about the Goldie situation, even though Aaron dragged her in. Alex definitely should have made a statement, but he pushed out on that. So yeah, there's a lot of um, fake people that either want to get in it for the clout or they're ex-Scientologists that never deprogram and carry that Sea Org and narcissistic personality over with them. They never decompress. They just slide out through an easy path so I don't think they're ever challenged to have to break down that programming. And yeah, man, that's why I, I support this community. In general, it's a good thing, overall speaking. And we're all slinging shit, as Marcus Sawyer told me, to keep things into perspective at the same area. So that has to be good, man. I totally support that. But at the same time, I have my own boundaries up where I don't just like somebody automatically, which I've learned the hard way, because we have a shared mutual trauma. Because we're ex-Scientologists does not mean I would hang out with this person or this person's a real friend in real life. So I've learned to find the halfway point with that where um, I don't like the community in general on one level because it's fake, um, it's controlled opposition, um, and it rubs me the wrong way. That shit is what I hated in Hollywood. I hate that shit. Um, that's also why I didn't want to go back on Andrew Gold's show, if you guys must know. Uh, cause he's another person that's talk shit where he's like, Doug must've taken down his YouTube channel cause he wasn't making any money. No, Andrew, that's how you think. I actually do it because I care. And I got my channel taken down multiple times cause I'm trying to speak the truth and that can get you in trouble when you don't just do clickbait shit. Damn man, I'm on a fucking roll tonight. This has been a long time in coming because there's people have been talking a lot of shit where I just kept my mouth shut cause I don't want to get pulled in and it's okay. And you know, I don't want to police everybody. But yeah, man, Andrew Gold, you know, people are like, why won't you go back on his show and this and that? And I've even given him people um, after that who he's just totally brushed me off, you know? Oh my God, there's so many fucking phonies in this community. And again, I think it's just a YouTube or societal thing. I don't think it's unique to ex-Scientologists, but this is why I 
surprise I ever got on YouTube and I hate social media in general. Like people post their pictures on Facebook. I don't like any of that fake shit. And, um, it very well could be me personally, just having an overreaction because of what I got, because of what I, <clears throat> because of how sensitive I am to that living a fake life most of the time. And then also I never liked that in general. That is my biggest button is when people are fake tons of it in this community and, um, it needs to fucking go. And that's also why <coughs> Alonzo, just like zero dark Tony, I would say is semi helpful in that because at least he, even though he is an unaware narcissist and he craves attention and he completely steals people's shit and like stirs up drama, some of it like slinging shit, you know, you're going to hit a hit it right. Like Tony, you, you know, he will call out people and he does have a lot of good information on his blog. And he gave me a lot of good information on the videos. So at least he doesn't toe the line of the official narrative either. I mean, he's trying to create his own cult and his own narrative, but it's somewhere between Indie Scientologists and Buddhism. Correct me if I'm wrong, Alan. But um, at least I, I respect him um, for not falling in line with these other people. I mean, I'd probably rather hang out with Alan, as unpleasant as he is, than the cookie cutter fucking other people in the community. So I look forward to seeing your, your next offering, Alan. If you could somehow de-narcissist yourself and uh, be a real person, I promise you, you'd get farther in life. But I know that once it's set, brother, and I'm sorry to hear that, it ain't going away. So you're stuck with it. <laughs> but good luck to you, man. Keep plugging against the controlled opposition. I got your back on that. Eight points of out R factor. To lighten the mood, can I puck your brows? I'm not quite sure what that means. God damn, eight points. You had to put that on me when I'm absolutely blasted. I'm trying to think on seven different levels about what that could possibly mean. Let me know in the comments what that means. Um, Jennifer, we're just going to do a zine here, man. Did anybody put this in here? Let's see. A couple more friends. It's always so hard to say goodbye, especially this, since this one in particular has been super, super therapeutic. Um, okay, no Xenus. Guys, let's pretend we do a Xenu. That means uh, you take a favorite hit of your, uh, you take a hit of your favorite poison, that being, you know, alcohol, everything from alcohol to weed to the crack pipe. I got to reload the pipe. This is not a crack pipe. And then Jennifer, um, as I'm smoking, I never comment, but watch often. I love your transparency and honesty. Thanks. Those are the qualities that make you want to see cricket must be smashed now in the backstage right cricket lay off the alcohol i see your smile i didn't even get to finish the quote okay but you did it right cricket we're reading our minds okay if you guys don't know it's so why i'm having a hard time getting off and having so many wins in this particular one is because she's totally covering everything she's doing the chat she's we got her in the backstage she throws up the comments so i it was so hard to focus on answering the question getting super high um, and then also finding the next question without the dead air. So fucking a cricket. Thank you so much, man. And throwing in the appropriate Xenu from Maryland, Maryland, this one's to you. Me and her, by the way, are going to do an, a video soon going more in depth on, uh, we kind of did a part one, how words, you know, how neurolinguistic programming, how redefinition of words, how important that is to, um, getting somebody involved in, in changing their reality and perceptions, which Culser masters at doing. I promise just a couple more and then we'll roll, but damn, it's, you guys want to hang out for another 10 hours and pull, oh fuck, I actually have to do something. Um, shit. Okay. Um, the reason the uploads have been a little funky the last couple of days, I am working on something that I'm pre-recording, which I have to actually kind of go do very soon, uh, for a couple hours. And then that'll be posted probably within a week or something. But I think you guys are going to like that. It jumps on to the deep dive videos that we've been working on. But I just realized I can't stay here all night because I had an appointment at 10. So there's the Xenu. Um, we'll just do two more. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. Hope I finished answering that and didn't cut your calm, as they say in the call. Um, miss, how you doing? Thank you for always being so raw. And real, Doug, you're awesome. Thank you very much, my friend. Um, go elsewhere. Would you go, um, Sarah, how are you? Would you ever go elsewhere in the U.S.? If so, where? Yes, anywhere about Los Angeles. No, I'm torn because I feel comfortable here. I've been here for like 20 or 25 years. I It's my home. If I do go back into acting, I don't want to have to move somewhere else and then come back to L.A. 
But that's the only reason I moved out here initially. I've gotten too used to it where it would take, I mean, even the pandemic, because we got the worst measures, even that didn't get my ass out of here, even though I probably should have. But if I had to go, um, literally probably anywhere else would be uh, fascinating to me because I've spent way too much time in this town. I mean, there's not any place specifically, but you know, I've never, I'd always wanted to go to New Zealand. I've never been to Australia. I have been to a lot of places, but New Zealand and Australia in particular, I, I would want to, um, at least visit. I don't know. Oh, you're staying elsewhere in the U S why are you such limited thinking? I wouldn't really want to live anywhere else in the U S I guess I fucking New York, New York. I would, um, except for the fact that, um, I've been there a few times. It's, it has, it has this electricity that really fits my style. I love it. And when I come back from New York to LA, it takes me about a week to calm down about how slow everything is around here. So that's a place where I, I feel like a California, half California at heart because I'm, you know, like surfing and shit. And then I, but my real style is the energy of New York. So I would definitely live there if my bone structure and nervous system can take it. I can only stay there for a couple months before the concrete and the energy and everything kind of sucks me in and I feel like I'm dying. But uh, it's like going to Las Vegas, you know, it's really cool, you know, gambling, you're drinking and having a great time. And then after X amount of time, you're like, dude, I need to get the fuck out of here. So I would live, I would live in New York temporarily. Um, that would, that's my favorite place actually in the U.S. And then I need to get out more to um, to know where else I'd want to go. Montana is another place I've always wanted to um, live. Just anywhere in the country, any site, anywhere uh, other than Los Angeles, and this um, this city that I live in. I don't, I hate the city. Like I said, the only reason I'm here is just because um, the acting shit. I'm comfortable with it. It's um, you know, we do have beaches. It's there are some benefits. I do like the fact you can do anything. Uh, it's not like a middle class town where you know you can do shit at night. It's a little more alive, but um, but there's many drawbacks too. Where I would love to just be uh, in nature, and I definitely am missing something by not being connected to that and living in this concrete jungle. We'll end off with Marilyn. Um, Doug, I can't wait to cover NLP with you. Awesome, Christian cult leaders use repetition and cadence also right okay cool i think philosophy asked that question earlier right philosophy about the voice droning and how that's used to well marilyn will be able to inform us more about that awesome i'm doing a morning's musing i'm going to link marilyn's um channel in the description box she puts up stuff every day sometimes multiple times a day so she's doing one tomorrow about music used as manipulation tomorrow no shit. i will definitely check that out Wow, we got to get you on here more often, Marilyn, too, so we can really break some of this stuff down because this is the kind of stuff me and Marcus were doing and we were breaking down the bridge and how the psychology of it all works. And I really want to get back to that. And you seem to know so much about this. So I will definitely tune in tomorrow. If that's your guys' um, topic about, you know, getting into the intricacies of how all this shit works and not just, you know, joking about it all the time. She's got some amazing content. One more, then we'll end off. Doug, you weren't, hey, love it. Doug, you weren't a piece of shit. You were disassociated from yourself by cult design. The force is strong with you. They couldn't keep you down. Thank you very much, man. I really appreciate that. I was talking with a gal today, um, Bryce from Esoterica Atlantica or whatever. And other people have said this and they said, God, you're so courageous to get out. Like the courage and the strength, the spirit. Guys, honestly, it scared the shit out of me. There was no courage involved because I was terrified. I had my life changed by accident. There was no way out unless I wanted to go back to the cult. I thought I was going to die. I went through every emotion and their mother. And somehow by a miracle, I came out on the other side, but I was scared for about 10 years straight. And I did not have courage uh, about like, I'm going to triumph over this. I wanted to fucking kill myself. It's just a, a lot of work. So um, thank you. And I never felt like my spirit was strong, but I definitely became stronger, much stronger and much wiser because of this experience where, like I said, I'm sorry if I maybe came on too strong with the people that I feel have lied about me and crossed me lately. And it's been building and building and building. But I do, um, I do have a, like I said, button on, um, on weak people, man, because like I said, man, I was like closer than a cult and, you know, I was, um, just fucking i had a safety net and when i got booted out of that like i said earlier all my woes that seemed so relevant at the time 
I had a real, whoa, man. I wanted to, you know, kill my parents. They had to get a restraining order on me. It's all I would talk about with my friends. I was scared all the time. I never knew I, where I'd get money for food some days. That was constant. I thought I'm not going to get to the next day just from not having fucking food. I had to do a lot of unusual things um, to survive. And I don't think any of it involved having a strong spirit or courage because like I said, I was terrified for 10 years straight, but it definitely did make me stronger. So when we get locked down in our houses again, when I can see through lies that are, that are so obvious nowadays that weren't obvious to me before, and when people bitch about, you know, you're not calling me by the right pronoun and I'm offended by the word gal and God damn it, you just, you know, I did this video on Danny the other day just joking about guns and shit. And someone's like, you're not, you know, for guns, you're trying to take away our arms. And it's like, dude, like people get offended and misconstrue everything. First of all, I have the word conspiracy on my fucking YouTube channel. So obviously I'm not only pro gun. Um, that's the first thing that governments want to take away when they want to take your ass over. So no. I'm all for guns. I don't see any problem with the word gal. And I'm sorry if I can't memorize the 9,700 pronouns that I named out to get in, into my brain because of all this bullshit. That's a perfect place to end it, Marilyn, where, um, or Marilyn, love it. Marilyn, we'll see tomorrow. Love it. Thank you for kind of helping me end on a positive note. I definitely became um, a lot less. Um, the only benefit I got is that by being terrified for 10 years and having to work through it, and then, like I said, surviving somehow and coming out with the data, as L. Rod Hubbard would say, on the other side of it, it definitely made me, um, I will definitely speak the truth and say what I believe to right, be right, no matter what the consequences are. I can't be bought off. Um, that's why I have such a, um, I'm super fine-tuned because of what I went through about phoniness, lies, and about um, agendas. I don't like people that don't have integrity. I really, really, um, that's why so much of this bullshit in the community, everything from data lying to my friends bailing when trying to call some of this shit out to trying to make money off of trauma and somehow forget about what this is about and make it into some silly content creation, clout chasing game that a lot of these people are involved in. So again, if I'm coming on too strong, it could be me, I'm sorry. But I had a super reaction because of living a fake lie my whole life that I can't fucking stand in authenticity. Um, and I'm always my worst enemy too. Because like I said, I'm not perfect. I make fucking mistakes. I probably do bullshit without knowing it. But at least I'll fucking take a look at myself and not deflect like fucking Dana where all you got to do is apologize for making up bullshit. Now I got to, you know, handle the rumors. Um, you know, you could explain to me why you rub, why you just, you know, um, didn't text me and then you talk shit about me, you know, not very courageous, not a lot of integrity there. That's a good place to end it, man. I'm wasted. I got to go do this other fucking video. I don't know how the hell I'm going to make it through that, but really guys, thanks for hanging out, man. And what would be a good outro to end on? Okay. Let's go out with, Hmm. Do we do the sad one or do we do the bridge? Uh, or science Hollywood. This is a tough choice. Actually, let's go out with Charles Manson and O.J. Simpson. Why not? I mean, we haven't thrown that one up for a while. But um, we're doing, I think the Q&A is going to be a regular thing now. So Sundays at 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Today, this week was just a little unusual. But, you know, that will be the time. Unless some, you know, we might have a week here and there where I can't make it. But let's do it. We'll meet every Sunday. This has been awesome. If you guys ever do get sick of it, we have plenty of other content. I, we don't have to be locked into that. But this is like my favorite stream, man, because... I really feel like I actually get to hang out. It's a, you know, as they say in Scientology, a two-way flow. I don't have to worry about presentations while the chat flies by and there's like no personal interaction. And I get a fucking shitload of healing, guys, just by you fucking listening and making really good comments and making me introspect and that you even care and that you're hanging out here. Because as I said before, I was pinning down people in the grocery store to my agents and everybody else. They not only didn't want to hear me talk about this, but I lost all my friends by doing so because I was a burden. So it just means a shitload to me that you're even fucking here and that you you care. It, that that alone has made this experience a, a lot more healing and it's been worth it to get over my social media uh, phobias, even though I still hate it, to actually get on YouTube and keep doing this because I would have given up and stopped a long uh, time ago if it hasn't been such an amazing experience. So I leave you with Scientology's two, uh, two of their most astute students 
And we'll definitely see you tomorrow with content as well. we got some SPTV news to cover. Take care, my friends, and have a good day or night, wherever you may be. He come up with Diagnetics 1950. So a lot of the guys were uh, interested in studying how to clear your mind. That's where Scientology started. And then it got to be the process. At one point, I, I felt I had reached the state of clear, right? Which is so what? I, which is it in, in Scientology, I guess, is the area where you kind of, you're one with all, see all, know all. <laughs> at least that's the way I interpreted it at the time. You got to that state? I thought I had. I was uh, in prison when Diagnetics first started, yeah, 1950, uh, we, we fought the establishment. Uh, the black Muslims were coming in with the Koran on the dark side of the moon. Sometimes you just feel that you're in total control of your surroundings and can literally wheel everything around you to happen. And, uh, and I call, you know, uh, the Scientology place, the local place where I was first here in L.A. And I, saw, I even tried to get old of Mr. Hubbard at one point years ago. You know how the occult is, you get uh, involved in, in all kinds of under darkness things that are running under nooses that are running through uh, just, I don't know, you know, it would take too long to explain it all. Clear is, you can, uh, as I saw it, is seeing it all knowing it all, feeling that you're in total control of everything, but seeing it all, seeing the complete picture and feeling that you can control that picture. For me, that's what it was. Feeling that I was one with everything. How to clear your mind from past confusion, how to resurrect the soul to be reborn within, your, in, within yourself. So that's where uh, uh, Scientology started. Then I learned there was nowhere to go from clear. Well, but at the same the time, said, but at the same clear. time, yeah, I said, what happens after clear? Essentially, what I found out is that there's nothing. <laughs> that happens after clear. <laughs> there's nowhere to go from there. Whatever that means, you know, God is the devil, I mean, the clever devil, or whatever, you know, what, it, it opens up to wherever you go, whatever you're going to use, where are we going to survive, how's it going to go? You say, oh, I want to be all these individuals and I want to believe all these things, but then the wind blows in another direction and you say, well, oh, whoa, that hurts too much. I got to change my mind about something, you know, because like when it comes down and we go down in the basement and you're laying up on the rack, you're going to do whatever the king tells you to do. Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. Buy your copy at B. Dalton's, Walden Books, or wherever paperbacks are sold. A fresh look at today's problems.